So thanks for coming everybody. Just going to give a brief introduction. I'm Josh, I work for the Loon Rivers Trust as a farm advisor. We're doing a lot of work with landowners and farmers with NFM and the water quality project which we're running. I'll discuss a little bit about both of those. Then after me, Stephen Taylor, who farms at Bottomhead Farm, he's going to talk a little bit about what flood management work he's been doing on his steading. And then we're going to pass over to Rod Everett, who's going to talk about some landslips within, within his, his area and uh, water stories that correspond with those. I'll load my presentation up first. Share the screens. There we go. Is that up? Can you see that, Rod? Yep. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Good. Yeah, so I'll do a little bit about Loon Rivers Trust. We're a small rivers charity, currently four members of staff. We cover from all the loon catchment from Lancaster up to T Bay, on to Kirby Long Kirby Street, Kirby Longsdale, sorry, all the way to Morecambe. Our offices are based in Morecambe. Really nice catchment, and we're just trying to do what we can with every pot of money we can get our hands into. But my main role is looking after the Water Environment Grant Help for Forgotten Farms project. And I will talk about this briefly. So we got the Water Environment Grant and a section of it went towards my water quality project within two areas. So I have three sub catchments in and around T Bay which are Burbeck, Raysbeck and Balloon Headwaters. So the idea of this project was to give out catchment sensitive farming grants in areas that typically wouldn't be involved, so lower priority areas, but all the areas were failing with water quality. So in terms of going for a countryside stewardship application, people tended to miss out because they weren't hitting the higher levels but with this, we've got a cluster of farms in that have not had a lot of steading work done for a while. So we had 180,000 in three areas around T-Bay and 180,000 to spend in the upper wedding areas at Keys and Beck, Kesselsbeck and Fenbeck. They're all very small subcatchments, but quite farm dense. So we just, we had 306 caves put it down the middle Try and be as fair as possible. And then we went to 20 farms in each area and tried to do a bit of capital work, fencing work, anything to improve water quality on each farm. And then we subcontracted out to Paul Arkell in T Bay from Cumbia Farm Environment Partnership. So every farm involved got a five field soil tested along with the soil nutrient management plan so they could start mapping out where the fields are lacking in nutrients, where the fields are rich in nutrients, try and minimise any ru nutrient runoff from those fields. And then that corresponded with, on nine of the farms, a full infrastructure audit, going through all the buildings, all the farmyards, looking for any pollution risks. And then we had two clear plans together, and I'd go back and discuss grant options with everyone, work with the farmers, see what's best for the business, what's best for the environment, and try and come to a good compromise and offer some grant support towards fixing the problem. The same thing again in the wedding, but we had um, SAC do the contracting for that, and Neil Carter saying 20 soil nutrient management plans, nine full infrastructure reports, and now we've got a really good cluster of 40 farms they've got these plans set in place, the nutrient management plans for the next five years, and then the infrastructure audits is more of a 20 year farm plan. What, what work you could do, how it would 
influence your farm business going forward, get the best results for both. In terms of grant support, these are the grants that we decided we could cover. As you can see on the screen, mostly we've really gone for concrete yards, roofing over muck middens or stock handling yards, a lot of new drainage and fencing up like wash side fencing. But it was really the concreting and the roofing came through strong because in the small areas we were working in, because they miss out with the stewardship and catching something farming so much. Everyone really needs some yard work or some roofing work doing. It was just a shame we couldn't extend this project further because it was a very small cluster of farms that we could work within our boundaries. But now I've just got some photos of the work in action. This is a farm off at T Bay. It just got a little bit neglected. It's now got new owners in. I'm sure Lenny is listening. It's now under a lot better management. But these photos were from a year ago when I first went down to do an audit. And as you can see there's no, no guttering on the roofs on the left. So everything's just coming onto the yard, getting washed through. This, the image on the right hand side, I've highlighted the silage bit there that wasn't sealed very well. But all the all the muck from the yard tended to just naturally run off straight into raised back at the bottom. So on this particular setting, because we was originally going to do something with the silage pit, but the new tenants aren't using comp silage, so the seal on that wasn't really a big priority. So instead, we're reinstalling drains around the bottom of the farmyard area. I don't know if you can see where I'm circling my mouse. But um, the concrete area there is going to be renewed with new drains and new gutters on all the buildings to try and catch the rainwater with some tank, above ground tanks to capture that and reuse it all with some filters to water the stock. Next on I just had a couple of examples of um, middens. The one in the top left we are moving back towards the existing building and adding an additional roof. So that's just covered, try and minimise that effluent runoff. Move the concrete panels and turn it into one midden that's covered over because the beck is just at the far side of those IVC tanks. It's not ideal where it is, but we couldn't really move it anywhere else on the steading. And the idea is when we get this moved, they also have an open lagoon. So all the muck from that can be stored inside as well. Should help a lot. Now on the bottom right, that was a outside midden. They've allowed to store muck there for a certain amount of the year. Or we was going to introduce a concrete pad and, some, and a drain pit around it to catch all the effluent. Then it's not soaking into the ground or running off into the nearby water course. Another example of concrete in here, so it's just coming out of a muck store, it was already roofed, had good drains but the water wasn't going to the drains because it was just running down to the right towards the, the road where you got in the clean water drains there. So we have, as on the next picture you'll see, we need the concrete and change all the ground levels so everything that comes out of the mid-in should now flow to the left into the dirty water reception pit and any clean water that was landing on can just go down into the clean water drains. The farm is invested in a front load old brush so we can just go up there, keep it all nice and clean. And you can see the difference from trying to keep that clean to now trying to keep the new concrete clean. It's made it a lot easier for it. Another example of roofing. So this outside area was a stock handling yard and it just got massively poached, especially in the winter. We're working outside and all the effort, again, the beck is just behind the fence line. And you can see all the effluent ran straight off into there. So we've covered it, put some new drains under the building that hopefully takes all that erosion away. And it keeps a nice hard base. In terms of the business as well, a lot easier to sort sheep and 
cattle in there without creating the mess. So this, this is that, where the roof is, where the pin drop is on this next map. You can see how close it is to the water course. And that runs straight into the river Wenning, just down from Keith and Beck. Yeah, I think my, my last example is just another concrete yard. See how cracked and broken it is on the left. All the soil getting clogged up and, and then new base, new drains, channels in, directing all the water again, just making sure we're directing clean into clean drain, dirty into dirty irrigation tanks. So if you have any questions about any of the Forgotten Farms project at the end of everyone's presentations, we're going to do a hand raising thing. But the next section of my presentation is about our natural flood management work in T Bay. So we, we do a lot of work in that area. It's worked out really beneficial for us having multiple projects, working with the same people, same landowners, helps us get a really nice relationship going. So m our work that has been done in the NFM, multi-organisational, we all help each other out. But the main of the dams shown next was done with Lancaster University and through Cumbria Natural Flood Management. So we have, as I'll show you later on, a series of natural wood leaky dams higher up the gill at T Bay, but they're really hard to access. We have some drone clips I'm showing later on, but we wanted to set up a demonstration site somewhere where we had good access, we could take groups to look at, and we could demonstrate what we were doing higher up without having to get on the back of a quad bike and drive a mile on it to go and see. So at the bottom of T Bay Gill, there's a tarmac road right to this bridge and everyone can get out and we can see our demonstration site which is fitted with five dams and the dams just yesterday actually got fitted with the depth meters and the cameras to monitor everything. You can see there. Okay. So these are directly linked to Lancaster University's Environment Centre so we have the data all the time. Every 15 minutes, this camera takes a photo of the depth, gets uploaded onto a series of charts, which goes along with some flumes we have at the bottom of the dams. And all this data collates, and we get a really good, every 15 minutes, a log of what depths of water is at, how much water is coming down, how much the dams are holding back. And we have this set up on all our, all our series of dams that we have set up. I do have the drone footage to show you. It's a bit shaky, but it was our first time using the drone up there. But this first one is just a demonstration side. So it's just what should play now. Is that playing, Rod? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. See, in terms of flood prevention, these ones probably aren't doing as much as the ones at the top, but they're just mainly there to demonstrate when we get people around to come and have a look. There's just a few different kinds. It's all English larch, the wood that's been used. So we have some double with a gap in between and just some single these are all in and they can all be adjusted next year when we've got some good data back from the Doppler meters. So we have a larger one at the bottom to show how we can spread the water over a bigger area and the final one before it goes back into the system. So these next times, it's a bit of a longer video, this is a, um, I think there's now Altogether on the gill, we've installed 77 dams all the way up. And this is a drone footage that I got of them all going from top to bottom of the gill. It's a bit shaky, it's the first time on the drone. So 
interesting. All these, like I said before, they can be adjusted. So we're going to watch them for a year, get some good data, see if any come out or get loose, see why. Because hopefully if we have one that moves, we can log on, check the data, see whether it was a big storm or a small storm and make an adjustment to the gaps or levels that they're installed within. This has worked really well for us. We've not managed to get any drone footage when it's been in full flood because obviously you need to, you can't take the drone up when it's absolutely chucking it down, but you need to find in that small window in between where it's rained heavily and then it's cleared up. We're going to try and get some footage in flow. But all this area can be flooded. It doesn't affect any houses, anyone's land. It's all just a really good area to for us to get a good example of where we can improve how we're installing them and the effect that they have. This next video was it's a bit of bad footage, I think it corrupted, but it just shows you a bit of a higher up view, just shows you a bit more of the scope of it all. And up on the fell, there's a, there's a lot of work going on with multiple organisations. So, and at Cumbria Wildlife Trust have worked with local farmer Tim Winder, who has installed all these dams for us. And he's really got into NFM. He's done a lot of work with us. They're all brilliant. We installed them. We've not had any break or move yet. He couldn't be with us today, but he, he has done a lot of work. Cumbria Wildlife Trust, they've installed a series of dams with metres on. They've planted 60,000 trees with Natural England. And they've got a peat restoration project up on the fell as well. So it's all contributing to the same thing, really. I don't think the sheep like that drone going over there. Yeah, so these next dams are the less box dams. These are Cumbria Wildlife Trust have installed with Tim and Lancaster University. You can see a bit clearer when I was saying about the camera and the depth meters before. They all go down at the bottom of the series of dams. You've got this flume. So the flume re measures flow rate and quantity. It all goes back to the, the meter that's powered by the solar panel. That's what beams all the data up to Lancaster University and on the top of that it has a rain gauge so it can depict how much rain's coming down, how much rain is going into there and all the data can collaborate together to give us a really clear picture of what's going on up there. The all, a lot of the bigger dams at the bottom have tubes on the side of them, I don't know if you'd have seen before, and that measures the pressure of the water and the depth as well so it all gives us a really good idea of what the water's doing. Just a quick footage of those dams, not as long as that. The solar peat restoration project is around this area as well. You can see the tubes there with the depth meters and the water loggers in the tubes. So it's impossible to get up to these ones unless you've got a quad bike. So that's why we've got the demonstration site as well. And I'll quickly show you the data that I've talked about where it all goes. There's a link there. I'll leave it up for a, a couple of seconds. If anyone wants to jot it down, that's where you can click on at any time to see what the meters are bring, what data we're collecting about 
So if it's raining, you think, oh, let's have a look what the dams are doing. You can just click onto it, log on, and you can have a look at the data. I'll just leave it on for another minute, and I'll show you where it takes you. So that takes you to this. Does that come up for the rod? The data set. So you can see T Bay Gill rain gauge, T Bay Gill water levels. Same for the dams. They're all on. No, it gives you a bar chart. Of, it's quite hard to read if you've never done it before, but. You have a play around with it and you can get, so we know, you think, right, it's raining. We'll go on a couple of hours later and check. We'll be able to see the water level in the dams, how, whether they're working or not. So you can see, obviously last night there must have been some heavy rain because it peaked about nine o'clock. Last night we've had a peak on those, so. We, Nick Chapel at Lancaster University reads and interprets the data for us. He's a bit more clued up on it. Okay. Yes. So in terms of, well, I'll just put that slide there a minute again, if anyone didn't get that link. But yeah, from the Lunar's point of view, that's what we know up at T Bay. And like I say, if you've got any questions about any of that, at the end, when everyone's finished speaking, we'll just, do a question session. If you click the blue hand button on the participants, you'll just be able to raise your hand, we'll ask you to ask your question and then lower your hand, but we'll do it when everyone's finished speaking, if you don't mind. But I'll pass you over to Stephen now, who's gonna talk to you about his work on his farm. I'll load the presentation up. Uh, so, uh, Rod asked me to put his presentation together uh, for the for the alleviation work that we've done. Uh, so I've made a bit of a PowerPoint presentation with some pictures of stuff uh, and a video. Uh, so uh, we found that bottom head. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, bottom head farm sort of like uh, in northwest <coughs> northwest in Lancashire, about uh, twenty miles inland or something. Uh, so Upland Hill Farm, uh, ranging from 500 to 1700 feet. Uh, we farm 1700 acres now. Uh, we have 700 uh, breeding cows and followers, and then about 30 suckler cows and followers. Average rainfall of 84 inch. Uh, in the top of the Hiveman catchment, uh, running down into the River Loon. Uh, and then there's a map of uh, where we're at with like in relation to rivers. Uh, if you go on to the next slide again, I think. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> that's just like a short video of some of the grip blocking work that we've been doing. Uh, like blocking the old, old drainage channels that they put on to uh, get rid of the water off the fells. And now uh, paying to block them up again. Uh, it's like holding back the water and slowing flow down. Uh, stopping erosion, I think, and um, yeah, providing some habitats for birds. Uh, they're working really well. Uh, we're just um, in a new scheme, we just put another 1400 blocks in this week. Um, so, uh, and they've, uh, they've got quite a big scheme going on. Uh, started about 10 years ago, and they've all worked really well. Uh, if you want to, next slide again, I think. Uh, so we bought um, like uh, a uh, earth engineering subsoiler um, two years ago now, uh, and um, to like to try and break up the surface pan because uh, uh, land was just getting that wet and puddled, puddled from well from machinery use over the years and uh, must and from sheep uh, just trampling around in the winter as well. 
so we've done this to break up the surface pan and let uh, let more air into the soil. Hopefully, uh, produce hopefully produce a better sward of grass, uh, help root health as well. Uh, and uh, we think that it stops. Um, it'll catch quite a bit of water and let it go into the drainage system uh, underneath a lot slower, rather than just um, it running straight off and into a dike. Um, this particular subsoiler has like a um, hydraulic kickback on, so it's got like minimal disturbance for uh, like big stones and stuff. As you can see, it's hardly hardly kicking any stones out in the picture, and uh, it's hydraulic press roller leaves a smooth finish and then just lifts out at the end. Um, so this is something that we've tried. I uh, went out and bought the machine, uh, and we've been trying it. Um, and it's worked really well for us. Um, and something we'd we'll be looking to do more of. Expand that, expand out into the Loon Valley with it, maybe if we had any work for it. Uh, and then next slide again, I think. Um, then this is some concreting work we've done uh, this time uh, under a new high-level scheme uh, to catch like dirty water runoff from uh, around the buildings. Catch the last bit of that and divert it down to the right of the picture uh, and catch a runoff from the bidding a bit better as well. Uh, put it all into a dirty water system. It's just like, it just, um, with a pipe that siphons out of a, a lagoon and just lets it go out of a small pipe slowly over a long period of time. And then this should uh, tip clean water away from that as well, uh, just out of the way. Uh, if we go to next slide again, um, these are some uh, like flood alleviation ponds uh, that we tried building uh, at the bottom of sort of at the bottom of uh, a big like a big uh, stream uh, just above the river. Uh, so a little pipe at the bottom, and then the water will flow out, uh, flow out normally, and it'll hardly hold any water when it's a slow flow. But then if there's like, a big flash flood. Hopefully it'll catch a lot of water and it'll um, and then it should trap silt as well, empty them out, and then we can empty the silt out. Uh, don't have to catch more silt, stop silt washing downstream as much. Um, I think they seem to be working well uh, this year. Uh, next slide again, I think. Oh yeah, and then we've got um, a Facebook page and a fancy QR code if you want to scan it and follow the Facebook page. Um, that's it, so. I hope that was all right. Yeah, good, thanks, Stephen. I'll pass you on to Rob now, I'll put his presentation on. Hello. Um... <coughs> I live in a backbottom farm, which is up the River Roburn, which is one of the tributaries of the Loon. Um, what I've been, I've been working with farmers up the valley to look at how we can slow the flow down. And I thought it would be good really to give a story of four of these different landslips that have occurred, because they give you some idea of how, what things are affecting this, this tributary. Have the next slide. So to start with, what we want to try and do is to take the peak off this. So this is the flood, this is the river level just below Ray. And this is the, the flood, flood on the 6th to the 13th of October. And you can see we've got a, in the centre of it, we've got a real high peak. And what we're really trying to do is to, to reduce that high peak. And if we can get that water to slow down and spread over a much longer period of time. So at the moment we get this really, like the central picture, is it in full flood? And then the next day it's back down to the calm level. Um, if we can actually spread that flood over two days, some of the best rivers in the country had that flood spread over about a week. Um, so that would be the ideal situation that we could go for. Have the next slide. So this is one of my neighbor's lands. Um, this is one of the key things I've found is to get 
when it's actually torrential rain to get out there and see what's happening. So if you see the fields flooding around you, that's the time to go out and really find out where it's coming from. So this is it's one of my neighbor's fields, and this is in a, a high rainfall, a high, a high rainfall event. Um, we should have the next one. So just below that is where this landslip occurred in Flood Desmond. So all that water that was just sitting on the surface in that field congregated one narrow point and it caused this landslip. Um, and it took trees down, it took all the fence down between the, the two fields um, and it caused a lot of damage. So can I have the next one, please? So that's further on down. You can see a lot of it washed the track away. Um, can I have the next one, please? And it washed the gate away, and you can you can see that was the a, a vehicle track that got completely covered. And the next one. So one of the things that we can work with with that, Stephen has has also gone for the same decision that we're looking at, is the earth um, pan buster. And the idea with this is that on the top field, so the one above above this landslip, and many of the other fields in Robendale. Um, they're suffering a, from compaction, often with being heavily grazed and being grazed short to the grass. So we've only actually got about six inches of, of roots of the grass. So what we really want to do is to try and encourage that root growth. Um, so the idea of the pan buster is to go along the contour, so following the contour, at the most having a, a two degree slope on it, and if we have a two degree slope on it, that's going from the, the gully towards the ridge. So if there's any water gets in there and it starts to flow, it goes towards the ridge rather than going towards the gully. So it's completely different from the original sort of drainage systems that we used to use. So the idea of this is that it opens up the soil, it, the, sub, the pan buster will go in something like four centimeters underneath the current grass roots. It lifts the soil and it allows air into it. And the combination of the air and the, the water from the rain that sinks in there really encourages the soil microbes. And the key thing is really to get the soil microbes going. Once we've got the soil microbes going, then that will encourage the root growth of the grasses and we can end up with, with grass roots 18 inches, two feet deep. And that's really what we need to be going towards. Um, if we can get the soil right, we should be able to, in an ideal situation, you can get up to about 74% air within the soil. So that space is between the soil particles. So it's the soil fungi and the soil bacteria that we really need to build. Can have the next slide. So one of the things that, at the same time as putting the, the pan buster in, the idea is to try and add beneficial bacteria and beneficial fungi. So um, some of the neighboring farmers now are using a, a biofertilizer. Um, the one they're using at the moment is a thing called Actifirm, um, which is effective microbes. And that's being spread in the, put in the slurry and it's being put onto the manure heaps. And that gives a, a good breakdown and it really encourages a lot of effective microbes to develop. At the same time, we're also putting on um, a basalt rock dust. Um, so that also helps to stimulate the earthworms and stimulate the soil bacteria. So this is something you can buy off the shelf and it's a, it's a soil stimulant. Um, one of the things that's particularly important is trying to get the fungal element. Um, if we lose the fungi, um, the fungi is important because it, it goes through, the, I mean, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of different varieties of fungi in our soil. So we should have a really rich fungal element. If we've been using NPK fertilizer, or we've been using things like Roundup, we'll have damaged that. Um, a recent research project at Rothamsted has shown that the soil structure where people have been using NPK fertilizer, they have a lot less 
holes within the um, within the structure. So that means it, it's more compacted and it doesn't allow the, the air in, it doesn't allow the, the bacteria to develop. And what we're trying to get is a mixture of, of aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. And then you'll end up with little soil structures where you've got lots of, if you look at the soil, it's got lots of little round balls and they're in clumps that are stuck together. And the thing that sticks those together is the fungal element. Um, it's a thing called glomalin. Um, that is like a glue that makes the soil structure really well. So we've lost, a, we're losing quite a lot of that on our farmland. So a key thing is to get that back into action. Once, once you can sort of see the, the action of this thing called Active Firm, um, so you should be able to see that within six months or maybe a year afterwards, as the microorganisms get going. Um, once you keep, say with that stain slide. So one of the things there is also to add a biofertilizer. So this can actually be made of cow manure, fresh cow manure, molasses, ashes, milk, water, and fine basalt powder. And that's fermented um, for a few months. And then that can be sprayed back onto the land and it really builds up those soil microbes. Have the next slide. So that's, that's the key for that, that particular landslip. The other thing with that is just at the top of the slope is to try and put in some woodland. Um, and the woodland will help to, the tree roots would help to take the water down into the ground and help to absorb it before it goes over the, the steeper edge and causes a problem. So planting hedges along the contour, planting woodland is a really good system for slowing the water flow. Have the next slide. So this is another farm nearby us, and this is in a in a big rainfall storm, and you can see the point where the arrow is, and that is a a place where the farmer has put in a place for the tractor to drive over a stream. So he's put in a like a dam with a pipe in the bottom, but in the stream flows that overflows out of the stream and across the fields, so it comes across his land, it comes across another neighbor's land, and then it comes onto my land. So if we go on to the next slide. So these are the, the flows that are coming across the land. And you can only see these in extreme rainfall conditions. Um, so, so to me, it's important to identify where those are. The next slide. So that water that's overflowing there, it comes across the fields, well, eventually it works its way down a footpath. And in this footpath, um, the country, the Forest of Boland A and B um, helped us improve the footpaths and put in this drainage ditch, the footpath, to stop the footpath being wet. But what happened with this overflow is that all that rainwater got concentrated in one particular area. Have the next slide. And this is what happened in Flood Desmond. Um, so there was about 30 big larch trees and all the water that came up from that passing place with the tractor caused this landslip. Um, so it gives you some idea of how important it is to work with neighbors, to get to, to really try and work out where the water's coming from. Now the next slide. So one of the things that we're working with that, with that particular stream is to put in some check dams to help slow the, the water back. This is a, a technique that was used in Slovakia um, where you put in the, the timber and then you put in brushwood in between and it helps hold it back. At the same time as holding it back, we also have more wood up to the side of it that diverts some of that onto a, a rushy area where it won't cause any damage. So it, it cuts that peak out, off the rain, off the, the flood. Have the next slide, please. Another area we have, this is Whitmore. Um, this was drained in the, just after the war in the 1950s. So drainage grips were put in. It also had heather beetle. Um, so it damaged a lot of the heather. And it also had 
when there was a subsidy on the number of livestock we had, um, it was fairly overgrazed. So what it's ended up with on this area is the sphagnum mosses have got damaged. In many places it's bare rock and there's a very fast runoff from this area. The particular time when it's a fast runoff is when it's been hot and dry. So if you've got a hot, dry weather and then you get heavy rainfall, often that rainfall is about 15 degrees cooler than the land. And it's like putting water onto the top of a, a hot plate. It just runs off very quickly and there's no sinking in. Um, so one of the things that up here is in the long term, we want to try and hold the water back and try and get the blanket bog back into good condition again. Have the next slide, please. So downstream from that area, we have, the, as the beck gets, gets steeper, it goes into the woodland and in the woodland, it causes a lot of erosion. So we've had big landslips in there. The stream dropped, has dropped from the 1920s. It's, the level of the stream is about 15 feet deeper now. Um, and the, this area, you can see all these trees that are landsliding and all the, the earth that's getting into the water and the hedge has been under, undercut. Um, that's happened in the last 18 months. Have the next slide. And just at the bottom of that area, um, you can see the, this stream that you can see at the top, top left, um, that was a hayfield at one stage. So in Ray Flood in 1967, that developed a stream that went straight across the field. Um, and now that's, with the floods, it's slowly developing a more of a sinusoidal shape. Um, but it's still eroding badly. And the water that's coming down there holds a lot of soil. So from a farmer's point of view, if we're losing our soil, we're losing our fertility. And it's really important that we actually hold that on the land. Next slide. Please. So developing the blanket bog, so here we've got tussocks um, with the sphagnum mosh, moss, dwarf shrubs like heather, bilberry, cross leaf heath, cranberry. Together they hold something like 80% of their volume in water. They also keep the ground cool. So underneath, if you put your hand into these tussocks, the water's a lot cooler. And because it's cooler, it may, means that the water there is less dense and it can absorb into the ground. If you take those away and, and the water gets heated up by the sunshine, then it doesn't sink into the ground. So these help the water sink in to build up the groundwater. Um, and the, tuss the rough tussocks also just slow the whole flow down across the landscape. Next one, please. Another area we have is, is Maladale. So the picture on the left is an area of dry desert gully erosion in Jordan. So these are all gullies. It looks like a blood vessels, but it's gullies. In Robendale on the, the right hand side, we've got a similar picture. And it was really when I saw that picture on the aerial photograph, I thought really there's so much similarities between the wet desert and the dry desert. So to me, we've actually going towards a, a wet desert situation with many of our uplands where they're creating, the runoff is so fast, it's creating this big gully network. The next slide. So on 8th of August, 1967, at five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so I want you just to, to stand up, everyone. And I'll just unmute everyone's In a minute, I'll unmute everyone. But what I'd like you to do when we, you stand up is to just tap your head and then slowly to work down your body, hitting it faster and faster. And then when you get to the thighs, really make as much noise as you can. Okay. So if I unmute everyone so we can hear what's going on. <laughs> if everyone can start tapping their heads. Everyone should be unmuted. Right, try again. Doesn't seem to be coming through. 
the unmuting has not worked as well. Not coming through. <laughs> okay, so you should be hearing a really heavy rain. One of the things about the, the heavy rain is if you can imagine being there, going out in that rain, you've got your most waterproof clothes that you've got on. Um, the rain gets through them all, it fills up your wellies, it fills up your pockets. Where you're standing, the rain comes up four inches, eight inches. Um, wait a minute. All right, if you took off and just mute there, that's all right. So with that amount of water coming down, um, it in 8th of August, it got to the point where in higher Salter, um, it came up over your Wellington boots in a few minutes, a really quick runoff. So about 5.15, it came and hit the farmhouse where I live. On the next slide. So the top left-hand corner is the farmhouse. And that used to be a five bedroom farmhouse with Shippen, um, hay barn, out barns, machinery sheds. And it was left basically with the, the kitchen downstairs and the bedroom upstairs. And Bill and Alice, Bill had been sorting sheep out just by the river. And he'd moved inside because he could see this big flood coming down the river. And he found Alice in the bedroom. And while they were in the bedroom, the rest of the house and all the other buildings got washed away. 13 houses were lost in, in Ray. Luckily, luckily it was in the afternoon, so no one was drowned. But it's a massive amount of damage that was caused. And you can see all the trees that came down. So trees were one of the big problems. A massive amount of trees came down with the flood and caused that damage. Um, one of the, the older people in the village, he was in bed, he didn't want to get up. And, and he eventually was persuaded to get up when a tree came through the wall of his house. Um, so it's, a, it's something that's completely devastated the village. Um, and we need to really be aware of how that, the effect of all the farms. So that's about 18 farms, the runoff from 18 farms affected that, that flood. The next slide. So one of the reasons behind that was a fire. The fire was in 1947, up on the up on around Malado. Um, and next slide. So what the bottom the bottom left hand slide is what the fell looked like after the flood. So it ripped away the peat. Um, one of the farmers said. You could have walked across there before and you could put a bloody great double-decker bus in there now. Um, so that's how much damage was done in, in less than an hour. On the right hand, the top right hand corner is the, some of the landslips that are occurring at the moment. And what we've got, that used to be heather until the fire in 1947. Then it was replaced with much more, much shorter grasses, it burnt all the peat away, and it was left with a, a situation where the sheep come and graze there a lot more. So they tend to cause more erosion on that piece of land. And you can see both of the top ones are current erosion that are occurring in that area. Have the next slide. So coming down from that, this is uh, on my land. So this is the rain that's come through I think it was 14 farms are coming down this river. At this point, it undercut this bank. Um, before the flood, the river was where the trees are on at the bottom of the, the screen. That's where the river was. All the land you could see was all covered in trees. So we reckon there was about 600 trees that came from this bank. It was a combination of the water flowing at the bottom and water coming over from the top. You can see there's water dripping down on the far side um, that's coming across the bank causing the erosion. Have the next slide. 
So one of the things that we've been working on on that slope, so this is over 50 years, it was 55 years now since the flood, or 58 years, whatever it is. So what we're trying to do is to try and stop that flow coming from the top of the slope to start with. So again, I had to go out in torrential rain <coughs> and found really that this the footpath on the top left is a footpath. Um, but in a, a real storm, that becomes a, a raging stream. And that goes over the bank and causes the erosion. So what we've done is put in lots of little, so the bottom two on the bottom left, they're just stones that are diverting the water away from the cliff, the steep edge, and putting it down an old track that, that is all right for it to go down. And then the bottom right is where it's, it's come onto that track and it spreads about 100 yards along that track before it flows over gently into the river. So it doesn't cause any erosion at all now. Um, but it took going out when it's really, really wet to get that. The next slide. Just in the picture, you can see that it's not very clear because there's a tree hanging over them, but there's a line of rocks coming out from the bank. So this is something we've put in in a number of places on the farm. And this, uh, at the bottom of that eroding slope, we've now, well, it's Stephen's, Stephen's uncle who's put them in for us. And that's what we call in-river training. So they come out from the bank at about 30 degrees, there's a gap between each rock. And in a flood, the water comes, comes in behind them and then it flows through the gap between them. Any rocks that are in the river get held back behind the, the bigger, these bigger rocks and you end up building up the rocks underneath the bank and protecting the bank. The old system was to put rocks up against the bank to try and to protect it. But in that situation, you end up with a gap between the rocks and the water jets through the gap and washes the, the bank away. So this is a system that's been developed in Austria. Um, I think we're the first people to use it in the UK, um, but it's, it's something that, that has, we've put it in after Flood Desmond in one area, and we put it in here a few weeks ago. And it's, it's a good way of protecting the bank. Next one. So that's four, four, landslips that we've been looking at um, and really I think it's it's so important to try and get the whole story of what's happening you, you know you it's going back in time it, so you know with the main ray flood it goes back to 1947 so that was a flood in 1967 um, so floods that can be just one short event that causes that damage what we'd, I'd like to see really in the long term is for the rivers to be held higher up, high up as possible in the catchment, in sphagnum, in blanket bog, in areas where they won't cause any damage, and for that to release slowly into the river. And with a slow release into the river, the peak flood will be a lot less, but it'll also mean that the the eels and the sea trout and the the brown trout and the bullheads are coming will come back into the river and be happy and then eventually we'll get the the otters back into the river so they all add to that diversity thank you i'll just stop the sharing now and i'll open it up for questions just give me a minute to sort it out um, So you should just be able to, if you click on one of the participant tabs, you should be able to raise your hand. If you raise your hand on the side, I'll unmute you, ask your question to either one of us and then I can work my way through the questions. There's one question in the chat. Um, oh. Have you got a link for the technique for in-river training? Um, on the, I've got a website, um, riverroburn.uk, 
and on that there's details of the in-river training and all, all other techniques that we can use for flood management um, and it also details what what happened with the ray flood um, and I think you'll find it useful because it helps it gives links to so you can find out what's happening with your own river um, it gives you where the monitoring stations are and how to look at look at what's happening flood wise um, in particular there's, there's links to work in Austria um, that where that idea came from yeah thanks yeah it might be easiest to put your questions in the chat that seems to be the best way to do it there's another one in there for you rod have you seen that one um the monitoring of the sediment stone accumulation behind the stones i'm doing that by photographs <laughs> i'm and it happens in the peak flood so even though in a, in a real flood, you can't see the rocks that we've got in the river, the river is still flowing in the same pattern through the rocks. And we can see really clearly quite big rocks that have been held back behind the others. I mean, in Ray flood, we actually had rocks that were between sort of 15 and 20 tons moving down the river, and they went about half a kilometer. So the strength of the river when it's got all those trees behind it is incredibly strong. Um, so this this has certainly helped. Um, we can see in, in our river how one one place where we've got a ford, we've put these in river training, and it's moved the river out from that bank, and we've made the another part of the river a lot deeper. So it's, it copes with with the flood a lot better. Hi Adrian, I've seen you raise your hand, I was trying to unmute you now. Yeah, I've done that right, thanks Joss. No, thanks for the brilliant presentations. All I was going to say is a couple of comments really, because obviously we're quite involved with this work too. It's great to be a partner with the Loon Rivers Trust and involved in the sister project TV on the south side of the Howgills at Sedba, where there's a, a flow gauge and exactly the same link with Sedba at the end rather than TV. But I, I was going to comment on the work that Rod's doing. I was fortunate enough to go on the conference distance farm walk on Sunday to have a look at Rod's work on the ground and it is fascinating to go and have a look at and I'm sure Rod wouldn't mind me mentioning that you are trying to develop a, an NFM sort of trail where people could go and view this work which is a really fantastic idea because I do facilitate a group of farmers in the Ribble catchment who are working on NFM work and the more people can see this sort of holistic whole catchment or sub catchment work in action the more they can understand it and more they can implement it in more places and we all benefit from that approach. Thanks, Adrian. Um, one of the things I'm, at the moment, I'm developing a flood trail, um, and that should be on the website. Well, I'm hoping it will be there in the next six weeks, um, so people will be able to look at that, follow it through. There'll be a, a, um, a recording of, of the walk, so you can come, come and follow the map and see what's going on. But I'm also very welcome to bring groups, groups around. Thanks for that. Does anyone get any more questions? I'm just trying to work my way through the hands up system or the chat. Uh, you just put your link down in the chat, Rod, for. Yep. The work that you can do at Melbourne there. Yeah, yeah in Loon Rivers Trust, especially, we have done a lot of work like Yorkshire National Park, I've been all the local trusts. We do a lot of work together, and it's that real approach from all the different organisations getting together and working on these bigger projects that has the biggest effect. And any support from anyone is great, especially those as a small trust. We're always trying to grow, always trying to get bigger projects, do more with farms, do more natural flood management. It's all growing all the time, and I definitely think it's a way forward. People should be looking into it. It's a good way to get into the environmental side. I think the, one of the key things with that is, is having all the different partners working together. I mean, I find that really useful. I mean, it's sort of, you know, linking to find out what Adrian's doing, finding out what's happening up in Cumbria. 
all over the place, and that's it's that interaction and cross fertilization that's so important. Now we can talk about what's happening with the in forestry areas and what's happening down on Morecambe Bay, and they all add to the picture of how we can work with the floods, how we can work with the changing changing rainfall that we're expecting. Um, I think I think it's one of the latest thing was something as fifty seven percent more rainfall they're expecting in one of the latest reports from the government um, in the winter but also much, much drier weather as well. So it's that sort of wet and dry combination that's going to be something we've got to deal with. We've got to work out how to deal with it. In the last, the last eight weeks, I've lost about 10 big mature oak trees that just can't cope with that dry, dry spell and then a lot of rain. And it's just, they've just fallen over massive great trees. And that, you know, if that was on a riverbank, that can cause a lot of erosion as well. One thing I was going to ask Stephen is the how deep he's working with the pan buster. Uh, about eight to twelve inch. We've been trying to go. Yeah. That seems to be. And are the grass, the current grass roots, what level are they at? About four, four inch. Yeah. So one of the other things that we've had on this last week is, is the holistic management. We went for a walk up holistic management up in the Lake District. And the thing that was really interesting there was seeing really long grass that was grazed so it was grazed just for one day and then left for two months so and they were saying that were getting something like twice as much grass to graze from that rather than having short grass that's grazed on a, a regular basis so i think the sort of holistic management and mob grazing is something that's in a way really important to try and get those grass roots developed once those grass roots are developed, then it really helps a lot um, with absorbing water. There's, an, um, there's one of the, the questions, do you think it's possible to achieve the same depth of roots with ryegrass as it would with a mix of deeper rooting perennials? I don't really know. Um, I think one of the important things is really to get herbs in there so some of the deep rooting herbs would be really important to get in um, a number of people are using um, chicory to go down deep um, even the dock the dock plants that we all hate actually what that's doing is it's trying to say to us our land is too compacted it's it what it's doing is trying to get down there bring up nutrients from down below open up the soil structure um, so if we've got docks we've got a lot of thistles one of the things that people are working with these biofertilizers are saying is that once they start getting the soil into really good condition the thistles disappear the docks disappear um, so actually getting that good soil structure is key to allowing all the roots to go much deeper um, i can't think what they're called no it's all right no Cotswold Seeds is one of the companies that has in their catalog, they have a picture of all the different herbs and all the different grasses and how deep those roots go. So it's a really useful images to help us think about plants that we could put in to help with this sort of work. Another thing that's, that's slightly to be happening soon is, is with the ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Scheme. Um, we have got a talk on it in I think two days time and the, at the moment one of those is about how how farmers might get paid for the flood management work that they're doing so it's 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 all open for discussion at the moment but it's something that if you if you go to that talk um, it's really important to feed back into the different people who are working on it trying to develop the elm scheme to actually get something that farmers really like and and need and it works well for them okay. oh, 
I'm just reading the questions in the chat now. Yep. How about beavers now? Everyone loves a beaver. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we were actually discussing this the other day, but we don't think we have enough trees, enough trees for beavers, so we're running riot. <laughs> I know they are they are doing a lot of demonstration sites now, aren't they, around to try and see what it would look like reintroducing them, but I think we're a bit away from that in the loom just yet. I think we would like a lower catchment demonstration site. Hmm. <laughs> we'd like a lot more. We'd like a lot of them. Yeah. It's something that we've we've looked at quite a lot of detail. Um, yeah. and I you know, I can see really that it's it's got potential. Um, with our bit of river, I think at the moment there's two flash flood river for the beavers to work on. Um, it needs a, a more steady flow and an area that's got quite a wide valley bottom. Because what the beavers like to do is they like to spread the water across the valley bottom, and they dam it up, create new channels, so you end up with a braiding system where the river's separated um, off into different braids and that brings back a lot more wildlife into the river um, I, about three weeks ago I was on a, a course in the well a, a virtual course in the states that was looking at beaver analog dams and that was fascinating how they're working with beaver analog dams so that's you know it looks like a beaver dam um, and it's it, what it does is it, it slows the water but it also attracts in the beavers into that area and then the beavers take over, readjust it to how it, how it works better. Because beavers are, are great engineers. They know what happens. We just come along and look at it from above and think, oh, well, that would work quite well. Um, so I think we've learned quite a lot from the way that beavers build their dams. So another thing with check dams that the beavers do is they put in posts at an angle coming out from the bottom of it. So when it overflows, it spreads that water further out it doesn't create if we have a, just a straight dam when the water goes over it in a flood it can dig out below the below the dam so beavers really know what they're they're doing oh well, someone's just put in the chat uh, the photo you're referring to Rod. i can just screen share it now about read that uh, give me a second okay, I'll figure this out. that come up now for everybody all right great yeah yeah so the some of the things that that you know bird's foot trefoil is one interesting one um the bird's foot trefoil is a is something they're using in new zealand as a wormer for sheep um so as well as having a deep rooting as well as fixing nitrogen it's also a sheep wormer the salad burnet and the chicory, you can see they've got really deep roots. Coxfoot's got really deep roots. Um, same fine, sun fine. Timothy, less, less deep. But it gives, Yarrow has got really deep roots and brings up minerals from deep down below. So actually trying to incorporate those in the, in the meadows it, is really important. And one of the things that people are finding with the holistic management and the mob grazing is that actually often there are plants that are in the seed base and they're coming back with the mob grazing it's because it's grounds given a chance to recover they're getting a lot of these these deeper rooting plants appearing that are already there um, yeah. yes it's interesting that point from robert mills um, about the soil organic matter and the water holding capacity so it, it is you know it, that's something that would be really good to understand in more detail um i'll just get a there's a book i want to show you The little book called For the Love of the Soil, and it's by Nicole Masters. And it's a really good 
book on looking at the soil, how the soil's interacting, how all the microbes are working, about the soil organic matter, um, about the different grazing managements that you can use. Um, and I'd thoroughly recommend that. Um, I'll type in its, its title in the, in the bottom. Is there anyone else who's here who's who's worked with flood flood management things? And it'd be interesting to hear if if people have. I know Adrian's Adrian. You've done quite a bit of work. Are there some of the particular things that you found working well with farmers? I think I think just to give them a bit of a plug. Obviously, with the Millennium Trust and with the National Park Service, we've had these natural flood management facilitation from groups although there are some limitations because it's just about essentially a group training what it really needs is the farmers collaboration is really important in this as you've rightly said on that catchment scale to make make things happen um, so that's really important but I think farmers I was a bit cynical about the approach initially but I think farmers learning together has actually been a really good approach um, in that regard but I think moving forward it needs to be more linked as we go towards Elm to not just be group facilitation, but to add in one-to-one -one advice, which is really important. But then, as you rightly say, the final element of that is to get the incentives right, to get to make farmers make some quite wholesale changes to the business and the way of the farming, to incorporate all the things that have been said, all the things that Stephen, great to see that farmers are doing it now, like Stephen and other farmers in certain catchments. But there's a lot more people need to take on this approach if we're going to have the impact, as you rightly say. So there's still the incentives within Elm are still a way off getting those developed, but they are the key to making it work. But I do think the group work by farmers is a really good opportunity for the farmers to understand and learn and move forward with making this happen. Yeah, I've got to say I've been to the facilitation groups in Yorkshire National Park for the flood management, and once you get there, you see farmers you come out of the shell and they see things opening up at ease. You think you learn more going to these events and seeing it firsthand on other farms at what it can do. And we, we've done a lot of other work with farms. I only talked about the TV area first time wise, but it's going on everywhere now. And the more you can get yourselves to, the more you see. I think it really hits home what effect it does have on the farms. And, and I think one thing I forgot to say is that what you've got to link this to is not just the incentives to Elm but the impact on the business economically, yeah. what actually works, what isn't working. And, you know, it, economy, economy obviously drives a farm because it's a business. But you, you've got to interlink as to how this would impact economically, how what they're doing now, how that adds up economically. And I think that's really important to give that sort of joined up business and environmental advice to the farmers to enable them to move, move away from what has been an approach, as I know, being a farmer in the past, but a, a generational approach of farming in one way. So I think business advice is a key element as well, Rod. In terms of farm groups as well, I know you'll have missed it, but at the same time as this presentation, you, um, Hannah at Yorkshire National Park was doing a section about farm cluster groups. I think you should be able to get the recorded version. I think they're all recorded. I think you will be able to go and watch again at some point. I'm not quite sure how you get them, but they will all be available online, I'm pretty sure, after this. You know, all the sessions are available, Josh, from the whole conference yeah. as of Monday, so you can catch up with things you haven't been able to go into, yes. But yeah, it was a session on, on these facilitation groups by the Forest of Boland a and b and the Yorkshire National Park Authority colleagues as well. Robert, would, Robert Mills, would, would, that be, would it be possible for you to sort of explain a bit more about sort of soil, soil techniques, um, how, how you measure soil and how you... How you get a feel for for its different structure and its the fungal elements and things like that? Yeah, I guess it depends very much upon what the what the resolution and the question is that you're interested in. Uh, like in terms of structure, 
uh, if we're linking to things like infiltration and water holding capacity, that's why I, I put the comment in there, uh, then we're looking for the distribution of pore sizes, so the distribution of holes essentially in the soil and how connected or not they are. And we can see this by looking at it and investigating it when we pull it apart and describing how they're distributed. There are lots of mathematical ways we can resolve this um, by measuring the ratio of sand, silt and clay and um, what's called the bulk density, which is the amount of uh, mass in a given volume. Um, but I think a lot of the kind of um, sort of descriptive, observable characteristics of the soil when you actually hold it and you open it up uh, can tell you a lot. And also there are key um, things that we might be looking for when we're looking at water um, relations in soil associated with impermeable layers like impermeable clay layers um, or sometimes iron pans that you can get. And then there are also some really interesting diagnostic features such as colouring. So sometimes if you have a soil which is subject to lots of variable water regimes, you can see lots of iron precipitating, um, usually on old root channels, things. Um, but, you know, I'd be really happy to well, talk about this for hours, I guess, but to try and develop some ways of working uh, with you uh, to come up with a kind of, uh, you know, simple approach without, you know, that's actually useful for you to understand uh, what we're looking at when, when we're sort of digging holes. The Environment Agency produced this booklet, I think it was called like Think Soils or something, uh, like 2006 or seven, which kind of did that job to some extent. I don't know whether that still exists, uh, but it'd be something very useful to look at. Um, we also mentioned fungi rod. Um, so if we're trying to look at the abundance of fungi in soil, it's actually very difficult to do, obviously, because they're microscopic. Um, and I guess one of the reasons why we're interested in fungi is because they help to aggregate the soil um, so they can produce lots of um, uh, extracellular material, so, to, so sugars and various other things that can help bind the soil together uh, and aggregate it in a very beneficial way. But interestingly, they also enhance the speed at which water can flow through a soil. Um, they can produce what are called fungal hydrophobins, um, and that can coat the inside of soil pores. And that's actually a competitive strategy that they use against bacteria, because they essentially make a lot of soil pores drier by doing this, uh, which can mean sometimes in extreme cases, the water can pass through very quickly. Um, and that's not really something that we can see. Uh, necessarily. Um, so it's something that we might test uh, in, in the lab and we are working on some sort of simple basic ways of, of being able to measure this in the field. Um, but yeah it's, it's quite a complex thing I guess trying to measure fungal abundance in soils in the field. Um, you've probably come across fungal to bacterial ratios maybe. Uh, this is something which is often uh, talked about as a kind of indicator of soil health uh, and this is something that I would urge a huge amount of caution with. Um, it's something that is very variable day to day, uh, depends very much upon how you sample and extract. Like we use this measurement sometimes uh, for various things. And just because you've got more fungi than bacteria doesn't necessarily mean a good thing. Um, it really depends uh, where you're sampling from, whether you're in the root associated soil or whether you're you know, several millimeters out from that, you can have a hugely different uh, fungal to bacterial ratio. Uh, and actually a lot of the bacteria that you find in this root area are hugely beneficial uh, for carbon storage and for storing nutrients in the soil. So uh, that's something I'd really like to, to talk more to you guys about actually and uh, try and develop some, some nice ways of understanding those things. Anyway, I'm just talking here, but... <laughs> Thank you. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's <a> picture. <laughs> Rob, can I ask you a question? What, what's the, if, if you had to have one measure for soil quality or soil, you know, soil quality, what would it be? What would be your... <laughs> soil organic matter, definitely. Um, if you can measure the abundance of soil organic matter in your soil, uh, as in the, the concentration of that, that is the number one thing that is going to help understand everything else. Um, 
it's, it's an interesting thing because of course it's the reservoir of most of the soil biology. It's the reservoir of most of the stable carbon and stable nutrients in a system. And when I say stable, I mean organic forms of nutrients. So not inorganic nutrients that we might typically add on as mineral fertilizer, but organic forms of phosphorus and nitrogen, um, which tends to be in the form of dead microbes. Um, but it's also the thing that helps to uh, constrain the way water and, and other things flow through the system. Um, we've actually got a really interesting question at the moment, just generally, as why, why does soil organic matter exist? And I can't remember who it was, but somebody mentioned thermodynamics in one of the talks uh, last week. And it made, it made me really excited because I'm actually thinking that soil organic matter is a kind of intrinsic uh, property of the ecosystem that is perpetuated by the soil microbes as a kind of down payment on their future uh, kind of progeny, because it creates the environment within which they can succeed in a kind of um, a sort of genetic basis. But it's actually all to do with the fundamental thermodynamics of the system. So it's really exciting actually to, to hear people thinking and talk about that. But yeah, if you could measure one thing, uh, that's it. And it's actually really easy and cheap to measure. But which, which measurement do you use? Because there's more than one way of doing it, isn't there? So the easiest way to measure soil organic matter is just burn the soil at 375 degrees. Oh, sorry, yeah. um, which I, I appreciate is not easy in a domestic oven. Um, and that's actually something that we're trying to make a bit more approachable. There are, so, there are other measures. So there's a, the uh, uh, a permanganate approach. There's also some other, kind, uh, some other uh, acid base uh, measurements uh, like the Walkley Black method. Uh, and some of these have their advantages and disadvantages. Mm. Um, but we're also trying to develop some ways of using uh, what's called Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, which is basically firing with a little uh, sort of like essentially a laser gun, an infrared beam at the soil. Uh, and that gives you a kind of profile of the organic matter in the soil. And it sounds really crude and really crazy, but it's actually quite informative in telling us about the, the nature of organic matter in surface soils. Uh, and that's something that we're trying to, to do a little bit more. Thank you for that, Robert. Oh, thank you. That's great. Well, we're about at time, but thanks everyone for joining us. It's been really good. Um, if you want any contact details, I think mine are on this, my slides, but I don't know if you want to put in the chat, Rod, your email address, and I can put my email address in the chat if anyone has any further questions. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I've just dropped my email address in the bottom of there anyway, if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Do you know how to stop the recording?